Hey Lee, well, we need a consistency statement on that. We do not very, very well. I don't have to worry too much about that. <laughs> All right. Crazy month. Great. I now call the September twenty second. 2020 meeting of the City of High Point Planning and Zoning Commission to order. My name is Tom Kirkman. I'm chair of the commission. I will ask the recording secretary to conduct a roll call vote of the commissioners that are in attendance this evening. Commissioners, when I call your name, please answer present. Mr. Uzak? Present. Mr. Kirkman? Present. Ms. McGill? Present. Mr. Moore? Present. Mr. Morgan? Present. Ms. Swift? Present. Mr. Venable? Present. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have seven members present. Very well, we do have a quorum. I want to acknowledge that staff from the Planning and Development Department and Transportation Department are in attendance this evening to provide technical and professional assistance to the commission. Before we move on tonight's agenda, we'll consider the minutes from the August 25th, 2020 meeting of this commission. Do any of the commissioners have any questions or comments or do we need to make any corrections? Anybody see anything? Nothing? Very well, I will ask for a motion to approve the minutes as presented. I move to approve the August 25th Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting. I'll second that. All right, I have a, a motion to approve as presented by Mr. Juzak. Uh, Commissioner McGill has second in the motion. I'll ask the recording secretary to take a roll call vote. Commissioners, when I call your name, please answer yes or no in approval of the August 25th, 2020 minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Mr. Juzak. Yes. Mr. Kirkman? Yes. Ms. McGill? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Swift? Yes. Mr. Venable? Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have seven votes in favor of that motion. Very well. By a vote of seven to zero, the minutes of August 25, 2020 have been approved as presented. Before we begin our public hearing this evening, on behalf of the Commission, I'd like to welcome everyone. Commission is charged with reviewing and making recommendations to the City Council on a variety of development applications and on plans and policies for the City. Our review includes conducting a public hearing to obtain additional information and any comments that could be important when evaluating these items. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting state restrictions on public gatherings, this Commission is meeting remotely in accordance with state law. This necessitates some changes to our normal meeting procedure, which I will take just a moment to explain. There are seven commissioners present in City Hall this evening. Items on the agenda will be heard as normal with a member of city staff presenting a summary of the application followed by the staff's recommendation. The applicant and those assisting the applicant and all who are attending this meeting remotely will then be given an opportunity to present information in support of the item. The planning and development staff published and sent notices that solicited the public to provide comments on these items by email, phone and or letter. Received public comments have been made available to each of the commissioners for review prior to this meeting. However, the period for public comment on these items will extend for an additional 24 hours beyond the conclusion of tonight's hearings. For that reason, the commission will not be voting on any public hearing item on tonight's agenda. Instead, this meeting will be recessed to Thursday, September 24th at 6 o'clock p.m. This will allow the commission to further discuss any additional information or comments submitted by the public before making an official recommendation to the City Council. 
Uh, before we move on to tonight's agenda, I just want to remind the commissioners that because of the meeting format, when you ask a question or make a comment, if you please identify yourself for the record. First item on tonight's agenda is City of High Point Zoning Map Amendment 20-17. Mr. Shannon. Herb Shannon, Senior Planner at the City of High Point Planning and Development Department, and I'll be providing a staff overview of zoning, um, zoning map amendment 20-17. This is a request by the City of High Point to rezone 208 properties, totaling about 87 acres, as part of the city's ongoing comprehensive, comprehensive zoning map amendment project. This is a multi-year project that began in 2017, and the purpose is to review and evaluate zoning of lands throughout the city, identify areas where zoning is out of sync or inconsistent with current land use policy, and to remove improper or obsolete zoning and propose, additional, propose appropriate changes. These lands under this application are part of round three of this um, project. Uh, the city council initiated this round in October of 2019, and there are three areas that are under review. Um, map one is near the intersection of East Chester, Centennial, and Lasseter Drive. Map two is off of East Lexington Avenue near McGuinn, and map three is in the eastern part of the city near the intersection of East Martin Luther King Junior Drive and Dillon Road. Now the request proposed to amend the various zonings of developments in this area. Um, these properties were rezoned between 1983 and 1999 under the former development ordinance. And as you're aware, our current development ordinance was adopted in 2017. The first area is dealing with map one. We have the Watermark Townhome Subdivision, a multifamily development off of Geyer Street and a townhome subdivision off of Ambassador Court. First, with the watermark development, um, that property attained its current zoning of conditional use residential multifamily five in 1983, and it included conditions regarding density and access that prohibited access from York Avenue, which is dressed to the east of the development. Um, staff is recommending um, removing the conditions and rezoning this um, development to residential multifamily five. In regards to conditions as to density, at that time in the 1980s, we did not have our current watershed standards. Um, if that area were to redevelop, the, it's in the watershed critical area, and that would not only limit um, allowable uses, but it has a much lower density. So density is taken care of with our current watershed standards. As far as access from York Avenue, the current development ordinance has a, a requirement that you cannot take access through a single family zone area to a multifamily development unless the zoning of that single family area permits multifamily or townhomes, which that area does not is zoned for single family, or there's no other way to access this, the property. In this situation, the watermark development has access from Centennial Street right here. So those two conditions from the 1980s are now govern the, uh, the development ordinance would govern those issues. And so you don't, you no longer need those conditions. In regards to the multifamily development at 2603 Geyer Street, um, that currently has a zoning of conditional use, residential multifamily 16, and staff is recommending rezoning to the RM16 district to move those conditions. The, it had a condition regarding lot combination and putting up a screening fence next to a single family home. The lot combination was done as part of the site plan approval when the property was developed. And the single family home was to the south right here. 
That single family home has been demolished. And in fact, that property has been rezoned from residential to conditional use office institutional and incorporated into that budding um, office development. So those conditions are no longer required. And finally, for Ambassador Court, a townhome development, there were conditions pertaining to road improvement, stormwater protection, and buffer areas, and lighting and access to Laster Drive. As far as the road improvement, that was the installation of that cul-de-sac that was done as part of that development. As far as stormwater easement and stream buffers, that is now part of the city's development orders regulations. And finally, access to Laster Drive due to the environmental constraints, and this is the area of the area, they have their stormwater control pond to the south of the project, and there's a stream, and there's flood zone area, area and there's about a 20 foot drop in elevation. So just those environmental constraints are gonna prevent any type of access to Leicester Drive. So that's a quick summary of map one. Are there any questions before I go on to map two? Right ahead. Map two is, um, for properties lying along the north and south side of East Lexington Avenue, just south of McGuinn, which is right here, you have the middle school right up here to the north. And that prop, this request is you're dealing with a property that's 2006 and 2011 East Lexington Avenue. Those are lands that are associated with the Greenway. You have a multifamily development, a five unit development at 2019 and 2027 East Lexington Avenue and the trails crossing um, townhome subdivision. When this land came, area, came in, there were conditions regarding um, density and dedication of land for the Greenway. Well, that land has been dedicated. And in fact, the Greenway Trail now goes through this area. So that condition has been met. As far as density, um, this, those sites are fully developed. You really couldn't get any additional development in those areas as far as the multifamily development to the north. Um, if that site were to redevelop, it would probably have the same or less density due to our current watershed standards. That site does not have any type of stormwater control device. So if it were to redevelop, they would have to meet current stormwater requirements. But based upon the size of it just being less than an acre, you really couldn't get more than those five units in there. As far as the trails crossing development, that is fully developed. Um, in the land use plan and city policy, with this being a core city area along the south side of Lexington, does support higher densities in those areas. So staff is recommending approval for all of this area to be re rezoned from conditional use, residential multifamily 16 to multi residential multifamily 16, removing those conditions. Are there any questions on map two? Any questions from the commissioners? Go ahead. And finally, map three deals with part of the Broadstone Village subdivision. This is located in the southeastern portion of the city. You have Malt, um, East Martin Luther King Jr. Drive running east to west. This is the intersection with Dillon Road. This is a 180 acre subdivision, but the zoning is only pertaining to about 40 acres of that development proposed for um, removing the zoning conditions. The first part, and that's the area that I have highlighted in green, is the commercial track. Um, there were conditions covering this whole development regarding road improvements, putting in turn lanes at that intersection, they improved that intersection, extending Dillon Road, because Dillon Road did not extend, it stopped to the north, and there were several of the stub streets to the north and to the west where they connected to. That's what most of the conditions dealt with, just completing that transportation network. There were conditions regarding that, trans, that commercial track regarding allowable uses. From reviewing the, the old staff reports, there were concerns as to what's gonna happen and will it be compatible with the surrounding area? Because at that time, all this land at the north of this intersection was undeveloped. Well, since then, the Broadstone Village apartment complex has developed and that wraps around the commercial track to the north and east. And lands to the west have been zoned for commercial use and we're starting to see commercial use there to, I'm sorry, to the west. So you have commercial zoning and a new commercial use has developed to the west. So those abutting uses to the north are compatible. To the south, there used to be several single family homes along the south side of East Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Those have been demolished in Atlanta, incorporated to the city's transportation um, 
facility, which is zone heavy industrial. So those issues about what's going to be developed and compatibility have gone away as that area has developed. Next is the multifamily track. That's this area here, the Broadstone Village Apartment Complex. There weren't any specific conditions on that track. They just they kind of felt it meet those transportation conditions as far as access for the overall development. So, so with no specific conditions regarding how that multifamily track should develop, staff is recommending it be rezoned from conditional use RM16 to RM16. And I forgot to mention on that commercial track, that is conditional use general business. Staff is recommending just be general business. In the final portion of the Broadstone Village development that staff is recommending rezoning is this little northern area. This was a situation where the, the old zoning boundaries followed old parcel lines. When those old parcels were combined and then re-subdivided, zoning didn't always follow the new, um, the new zoning and, or, or, I'm sorry, the new subdivision where you combine together, then split out for doing your lots. Those new lot lines didn't always follow the zoning lines. So you had a situation along on Bowers Avenue where some of those single family homes, specifically two, 3216 and 3220, they got split, they split the zoning. So the front half of their site, the area you see shaded in purple is zone R5. The rear part of that parcel, the area in the kind of teal color is conditional use R5. That's typically not an issue if the use is allowed in both districts. In this situation, single family is allowed in both districts, so they didn't have any reason to come in and rezone it, so they just went ahead and drew the lines that way. This will clean that up. The intent is that instead of having the, the property split zone, it all be just R5, and that will eliminate any future um, problems with sales where a realtor may say, what's the split zoning? What are these conditions on the back of my lot? It's just all R5 zoning. And there's some common area here associated with the Broadstone Village. Same thing, this is one large parcel here. This part of the common area is R5. This part of the common area is CUR5. You can see the stream running through that area, so you really can't do any new development back there. But while we're cleaning up the zoning in that area, where staff is recommending that, that CUR5 be changed to just R5 for that area as this development has met all their conditions as far as transportation improvements and so forth. So that's a summary of map three, and this is an aerial photo of how that area is developed. Um, this commercial track has yet to develop, but the apartment complex has developed, the other parts of the Broadstone Village has developed, and where you kind of, where we talked about that split zoning, that area is developed with single family. And this common area here will just stay that, you have common area associated with the commercial track, common area associated with the multifamily track, and other common area that's associated with other parts of the Broadstone Village development. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval of these rezoning. <coughs> staff finds that the request is consistent with adopted policy guidance because the proposed zoning map amendments are supported by the various land use designations for these areas as contained in the adopted land use plan. And the request is reasonable in the public interest because the amendments are needed to remove unneeded restrictions on the properties and to remove the outdated conditional use zoning districts. As always with a zoning request, the Planning and Zoning Commission must place an official record a statement of consistency with the city's land use plan and we do offer that statement in the staff report for your consideration. That is a brief overview of zoning map amendment 20-17. Are there any questions on any of those maps? Maps one, two, or three? Questions from the commissioners? Very well, proceed. Uh, I would note that um, we received about 60 phone calls in total on all of these. Once staff explained to the property owners what was going on, they had no objections. The main comments are, is this gonna change my development? Is this gonna affect my properties? There were a group of property owners that thought this was part of some type of eminent domain procedure, but once staff explained to them what was going on, they had no objections. Good. Was there anybody else in the city that was going to speak on this, or is that pretty much the city presentation? Okay. Uh, normally, this is where we would ha have comments from the public because of our meeting format. Uh, they aren't with us this evening, but they're, if they're joining us remotely, I just want to remind members of the public that you have an additional 24 hours 
uh, from the recess of tonight's meeting to uh, make your concerns or ask your questions to city staff and you can contact the planning and development department here at city hall um, anything from the commissioners do we need to uh, talk about anything else or we'll we'll table this one till thursday night very well we'll move on to Brenda Murrow Amendment to Unified Development Plan, Zoning Amendment 0301. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Herb Shannon again with the City of High Point Planning Development Department. And this is a quick presentation regarding um, revision to the Unified Development Plan for the Penfield Plan Unit Development under Conditional Use Permit 0301. This is a, a location map showing that development it's in the western part of the city off of West Lexington Avenue, Avenue about 1,300 feet east of Swans Gate Lane. Um, this subdivision, which is known as Plainfield, included an adopted conditional use permit with that plan. It was a rezoning for a plan development residential district. It was an adopted conditional use permit, and the conditional use permit laid out the specific standards as far as uses. Allowable uses were single family detached and townhomes, laid out buffer standards, access standards, and so forth. And then there was a separate unified development plan for um, this development. This was under the former development ordinance, and with the PUDs or plan unit developments at that time, you would have your conditional use permit, and then you would have a plan unit development laid that spelled that noted here's how the site is specifically going to develop. In this situation, um, you, this is um, the UDP of that site, the mint, proposed amendment UDP. But the UDP noted the circulation network and how each lot was going to develop. And that initial UDP noted that all the lots would develop with twin homes except for one, and that was just this one single family detached dwelling at lot three. There is a situation out there in which um, the applicant has purchased two lots that are designated on a UDP for twin homes and they and that applicant wishes to combine the lots and build one single family detached dwelling and that's specifically in this area. There are about 11 vacant lots there. Lot 44 and lot 45A, the, what, the intent was for it to develop like it is just next to it with two twin homes having a common wall along the property line. The applicant wants to purchase both, combine them and do one single family to hatch structure over that entire lot. Now, similar lot combinations for single family structures, which were inconsistent with the city council's adopted unified development plan, occurred in two other areas of the site. You have one right here on lot 34A and one here on lot 40 and 41. The applicant is requesting to revise this UDP and there are three purposes. First, to update the unified development plan to document where lot combinations occurred to allow those single family detached dwellings, specifically on lot 34A and right here on 40 for the one. So they've documented that. The second intent is document the location of the remaining undeveloped lots. And those are noted on the plan as vacant. So you have a little group of vacant lots right here, a group right here and two in the back. And finally, to revise the UDP to allow the remaining undeveloped lots to develop either with twin home structures or with a single family detached structure. So it kind of cleans up this to allow some flexibility for those remaining lots to develop. Staff has reviewed this request under the former plan unit development district standards. Uh, since this was adopted of the old ordinance, those plan unit developments are locked under those standards. So we reviewed it under those former standards. And staff has noted that the revision does not change the layout or development standards. So the perimeter buffering standards, street layouts, lot configuration as far as where the lots are located have stayed the same. The only change would be allow some flexibility as to how those final lots would develop. And it does not increase in density. In fact, it will decrease the overall density of the development as some lots have been combined um, for, to, uh, for just one structure. Therefore, staff finds that the requested unified development plan is consistent with the adopted plan development district, plan development residential district, and the conditional use permit for the Penfield development, and staff is recommending approval. That is a brief summary. Are there any questions that the commission may have on this request? Anything from the commissioners? 
Did you receive any uh, comments from residents? From the this city? is not a public hearing items where we do advertisement and send out notices because they're not changing what's proposed. There's no conflict with the zoning conditions. It's just updating the unified development plan. Anything else? Very well, thank you, Mr. Shannon. And as Mr. Shannon mentioned, because this is not a public hearing item, the commissioners can move directly to comments or deliberation. We can do that before a uh, take a motion. Any thoughts, questions? If not, and before I ask for a motion, I want to check with city staff. Will this will this item move to council, or are we the final authority on this tonight? This item was scheduled to be heard by city council at the October fifth public hearing. All right. So I basically we're we're recommending approval of the amendment. Yes. Okay. Very well. If the commissioners don't have any uh, questions or comments, I'll ask for a motion. I make a motion that we approve. Um, the Brenda Murrow Amendment to Unified Development Plan ZA-03-01. Very well, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Swift. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Commissioner McGill has seconded the motion. We'll take a roll call vote. Are there any questions on the motion? Everyone understand? Very well, I'll ask the recording secretary to take a roll call vote. This is when I call your name, please respond yes or no. Um, in response to the motion to approve the amendment to the Unified Development Plan. Mr. Uzak. Yes. Mr. Kirkman. Yes. Ms. McGill. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Morgan. Yes. Ms. Swift. Yes. Mr. Venable. Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have seven votes in favor of that motion. Very well. I don't believe we need a consistency statement on this item, do we? No. Well, by a vote of seven to zero, this commission has recommended approval uh, for this item as presented by city staff. There will be a final hearing on this, this item. Uh, as in front of city council, it won't be a public hearing either, correct? Correct. Uh, city council will determine the final outcome of this on October 5th at uh, their six o'clock meeting in these chambers. And the next item under new business is land use assessments for the I-74 East Chester Drive and Jamestown by Heidi, you're, you're good to go. Okay. Hello, everybody. I am Heidi Galanti, Planning and Development Administrator with the Planning and Development Department. And I'm going to be doing a presentation on land use assessments. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Hopefully, I'll be successful. Mm. Hang on. Sorry, I had this problem earlier and there. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, as I said, I'm going to do a presentation on land use assessments for East Chester Drive and I-74 and the Jamestown Bypass. Um, these Pre these assessments have been conducted at the same time due to their adjacency and similar timing. And because together the two areas offer more of a complete set of opportunities. They're only a mile and a half apart. And in where some areas in one, in one assessment are weak, the others may be strong. So they, they pair together well. Um, the land use assessments represent a look at a small area based on a specific need due to a change in the immediate environment. These assessments will not replace existing policy. They are policy documents that are concentrated on a very finite area to assess a specific issue. In this case, the issue is the impacts of two roadway, 
roadway projects on adjacent land uses. The policy recommendations of these assessments will be used in conjunction with other existing policy documents to provide guidance on future development opportunities. I'll start with East Chester and I-74. And as you will see, each assessment has a similar organization for ease of use by staff and the public. The first area, again, is East Chester. It's a 153-acre study area and covers an approximate one-mile section of East Chester Drive from Festival Park on the northern end and Lassiter Drive on the southern end. Can you all see my cursor when I point? Yes. 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 Great. Okay. Good to know. Um, there are four main goals of this assessment. They are to protect the city's water supply, maintain the safe and efficient transportation functionality of the corridor, protect adjacent neighborhoods from incompatible development, and protect the gateway corridor entrance into the city. The policy recommendations of this assessment will be used in conjunction with policy recommendations of the land use plan and the East Chester corridor plan. In the case of a conflict, this uh, staff would defer to, the, to this assessment. Main factors considered when doing this assessment were watershed restrictions, new road alignments, existing land use, and property ownership. Some general conclusions on this corridor is it's a very narrow corridor. It's limited, it has limited area for new development. Where new development will or could happen, lot consolidation will be needed. Um, we'll continue to need to uh, limit access points on East Chester to maintain its functionality. There are some street name changes that will need to be considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission at a future time. And there are some minor adjustments that we are uh, recommending to the land use plan. And also I'll point out that the majority of this area has uh, office and institutional zoning district and our new zoning district in the 2017 ordinance has a wide variety of uses, much wider um, than we had in the old ordinance. And I'll get into a little more detail on that later. First of all, with the street name changes, due to the expansion of the interchange, some adjacent roadways had to be realigned and some road names have been impacted. These are recommended name changes that must be reviewed and approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission after a public hearing at a future date. Um, first off, I'll start with uh, Hilton Court up here at the top. It no longer has a direct connection to East Chester. It used to. Um, then you have Cypress Court, which is, has a new alignment right here, and it now connects to East Chester at a signal up here, whereas before it used to connect down in this area. Gordon Road has also been realigned with a traffic circle, and then it comes down and lines up directly across from where Cypress Court is. There is also a cul-de-sac that was created. This is where Gordon Road used to come down and intersect with East Chester. It is now a cul-de-sac and no longer connects to East Chester. These pink and black dashed lines represent restricted access. So driveways will not be allowed in this area where you see that line. And staff has provided these recommendations um, for the Planning and Zoning Commission for future consideration. Now I'll move on into the land use recommendations. Staff took an in-depth look at seven areas along the quarter, but ultimately concluded that only two areas should be amended at this time. The map shows the seven areas and the common ownership of parcels within this area. So anyone who owns two or more properties is shown in a color with a number on this map. And then you also have the areas that I will go through and what we found when we looked at those areas and what we are recommending. Area one is right in here. There's an area 1A and an area 1B. It is in critical watershed tiers two and three of Ocala. Tier two only allows new residential uses at one dwelling unit per acre. And tier three allows new development at two dwelling units per acre or 35% built upon area. 
Cypress Court, as I mentioned before, cuts through this area. And 1A, we are recommending that it stay as low density residential and 1B remaining as office. This area 1B may be able to be graded into the city lake watershed, which will allow for some greater um, built upon area, but it's limited size and significant access constraints uh, will limit its ability uh, to develop. It will not be able to have direct connection here onto East Chester, and it's hard to see on this map, but there is a small area that is owned by DOT just as you turn into uh, Cypress Court. So access to this would have to be along the back side. Area two, it is this area back here that abuts the lake. It is in tier one critical area and it does not allow for any new development. Current uses in this area are single family residential. And as a general policy recommendation, we are recommending that as properties in this area may become available, that the city should um, consider purchasing them to continue to protect the city's drinking water supply. This is one of two areas that is recommended for amendment, and it is to go from low density residential to recreation and open space to reflect the desire to protect the city's drinking water supply. Area three is shown right here. Um, it is on the northwest corner of Cypress Court and East Chester. There are six acres that are split between Oak Hollow Tiers 2 and 3 and a small portion of the City Lake General Watershed, which allows 70% built upon area. This area could possibly be graded out of the Oak Hollow Watershed, which would increase its development potential. However, the immediate surrounding area, in other words, other undeveloped or other areas around it, are more significantly constrained with watershed restrictions, topographic constraints, controlled access, and a classified stream that make it infeasible for commercial development to happen in this area. In order to maintain the consistency and character of this section of the corridor, Staff is recommending that Area 3 remain in the office land use category. As I indicated earlier, much of this corridor is currently owned is zoned uh, office institutional. And with the adoption of the new ordinance, the office institutional district now supports a wide variety of moderate and high intensity office, institutional and residential uses, including townhomes and multifamily, as well as some minor personal service and retail services up to a maximum of 4,000 square feet and a restaurant without a drive-through. High intensity commercial uses are not supported in this area due to the continued policy concerns for protecting the aesthetics of the corridor and the need for continued efficiency of this transportation corridor. The next area is area four. It is this area on the uh, eastern side of East Chester between Gordon Road and um, Foxwood Meadows. It is approximately 22 acres. It is in the city lake watershed. It backs up to an existing residential neighborhood and is impacted by, by steep slopes and classified streams. Uh, current uses are office and a few single family homes with some undeveloped parcels. Potential land uses for the undeveloped parcels and single family parcels are office and higher density residential use. But it should be noted that there are some uh, topography and streams that may make development of this area difficult. The office land use designation should remain in support of these options. Area five is down here adjacent to the interstate between uh, the ramp and the new cul-de-sac. There are four lots that total about four acres, some of which have frontage on East Chester, but as I mentioned before, they can only be accessed off of this new, off the new cul-de-sac. Most of this area is within the city lake general watershed. Current uses are single family residential. Um, due to a lack of direct access to East Chester, possible land use for this area are office, higher density residential, uh, such as townhomes, condominiums, or apartments. 
the office land use designation should be expanded to include all of the properties in this area. So this is the second area that we are recommending um, that the land use plan be amended. The current zoning in this area is residential single family three. The next area is area six. It's down here um, on the other side of the interstate, also on the eastern side of East Chester between the ramp and Ambassador Court. There are seven lots that total approximately eight acres. They are mostly in tier three of the Ocala watershed with a small area in the City Lake General Watershed. There's a ridge line that runs through this area. It's currently a mix of office, residential, and a religious institution. Ambassador Court and York Avenue are going to be a reline down here, down at the bottom. So it will take some land from that religious institution and that home on the other side is also going to be taken. There may be an opportunity within this area to add a small area of local convenience commercial uses to accommodate some low to moderate intensity retail or personal service uses. For this to be feasible, however, it will require land assembly to manage impacts, coordinate access, and maximize development potential under the watershed development restrictions. Conditional zoning will be needed to ensure that the land use policies are supported. Therefore, the land use for this area is recommended to remain as office and medium density residential until such time as a development proposal is submitted. And at that time, a land use policy change can be considered. The final area in the East Chester corridor is area seven. It's on the west side of East Chester between I-74 and York Avenue. There are 13 lots that cover approximately seven acres. It is in tier three of the Oak Hollow watershed. Current uses are single family residential and offices. Protection of the Timber Lake neighborhood behind it are needed to maintain its, its stability. There is limited lot depth, as you can see. So potential future uses for this continue to be single family residential and small scale offices that are typically allowed in the transitional office district. The office land use designation should remain for this area. Next, I'll go on to the Jamestown bypass. This is a much larger area. It covers 1.4 square miles. And it's approximately a two mile section of the new Jamestown bypass from I-74 to the Jamestown limits. And it also includes the five, point commercial, five points commercial area between I-74 and Montlou Avenue. The goals of this assessment are to evaluate the impacts of the roadway project, examine existing land uses, assess water and sewer availability, and provide policy guidance for potential future development. Existing policies for this assessment are the land use plan, the US 311 bypass study, and the corridors, or the core city plan. And with, as with the East Chester, in a case of a conflict, this assessment would be used. Main factors that were considered in this assessment were the new road alignments, existing land use, property ownership, water and sewer availability, and watershed restrictions. The general conclusions for this are that there are opportunities for development in this area due to new roadway intersections that are going to be created, access to undeveloped parcels that have not been there in the past, and less restrictive watershed areas. It, is, it could be considered a new front door into the city. It will connect two major interstates, being I-73 and I-74, and there are some street name changes that will need to be considered in this area as well at a future time. There um, is a potential change in character along the existing Greensboro Road, as that is not gonna carry as much traffic as it has in the past, and there are some adjustments that staff is recommending to the land use plan. Street name changes. Again, there are some street name, uh, name changes that staff is suggesting. Uh, the Jamestown bypass that we're not showing the whole thing, but I'm zoomed in. Um, the Jamestown bypass goes off to the right and connects into Jamestown. 
where Jamestown already has an open piece, which they have called the Jamestown Parkway. So staff is recommending that that name be carried through from where uh, Jamestown is all the way to the center line of I-74. You also have Greensboro Road, which used to come through here, is now going to have this piece dead end, the area that, the area that I have labeled A. So this road will need to be evaluated and have a new name considered for it. Hampton Drive is now going to come down and intersect with this new piece of roadway, which I have labeled as B. And Lindale Drive will have a slight change um, to its connection to this new roadway. This portion here is Greensboro Road. This portion here will not have a name. Greensboro Road was named such because it connected two communities. It connected High Point to Greensboro. That's not the main connection to Greensboro anymore because it is now the Jamestown Parkway. And once you get into Jamestown, it's not Greensboro Road, it's Main Street. So staff is suggesting that a new name could be considered for this section of Greensboro Road. On the other side of the interstate, you have Greensboro Road that goes to Five Point Place where it picks up and becomes East Lexington Avenue. We're suggesting that this piece from the center line of I-74 to the existing East Lexington Avenue be renamed East Lexington Avenue. Now I'll go through the uh, land use recommendations for this area. Again, a much larger area. Staff took an in-depth look at eight areas within the study area and recommended six areas for amendment at this time. Other recommended changes will be based on assembly of land and specific development proposals that may be submitted in the future. This map also shows the common ownership where a, a particular person owns two or more properties. I will start in area one. It is in five points. It's approximately 21 acres. It's a mix of convenient service uses, including the Eastgate Shopping Center. The US 311 bypass study and the core city plan show this area as mixed use. It is currently designated as local convenience commercial and, in, and until a development proposal is submitted, we are recommending that it stay as local convenience commercial. The area is currently zoned general business and limited business. Area two is this long piece that is kind of sandwiched in between I-74, Deep River Road, and Wayside Street. It is the site of the old Presbyterian home up here on the north end and the evergreen or lifespan nursing facility down on the southern end. The very northern end of the Presbyterian home site is currently being used uh, to house uh, people aged 50 five and over. The evergreen site on the southern end is vacant and most of the buildings have been developed. There is very limited street frontage on Greensboro Road, so we have added in this small parcel on the corner of Wayside Street and Greensboro to afford better access opportunities into this site. It is currently designated as mixed use development and we are recommending that it stay mixed use development at this time. It is currently zoned institutional and until a plan or development proposal is submitted for this area, we feel that that would be a good holding zone for this area. Moving on to area three, that is this area over here. Uh, we broke it up into area 3A and 3B. It is along the old uh, Greensboro Road, which will dead end. This has some commercial uses on it. And then there is some undeveloped parcels back in here in the residential neighborhood behind. Um, for the area along the frontage here, it is a mix of commercial uses. Um, and it has some undeveloped lots. 
It also includes the um, religious institution on the south side of what is now Greensboro Road and a gas station. And uh, Spencer Road is on the western end, which will have a right in, right out only at a signal uh, with the bypass. There will be no access allowed on this southern end of this area to the bypass. The area shown as 3A is currently shown as community regional commercial and 3B is low density residential. Due to reduced access, area 3 may be better represented with a land use uh, designation with less intensity. Area 3B, with some assembly of land and access to the dead end portion of the old Greensboro Road, could support some infill housing with a variety of detached or attached homes um, on that, in that area. Because of these changes, the land use designation is recommended to change from community regional commercial to local convenience commercial for area 3A and low density residential to medium density residential for area 3B. The current zoning in this area is general business for the Greensboro Road frontage and residential single family five for the area to the north. Moving on to area four, it is on the south side of Greensboro Road and it is between this new road that will connect to the bypass and just east of Ring Street. It's approximately 14 acres. It will not have direct access to the newly aligned road on the western end, as I pointed out earlier. And it will not have access to the bypass. Ring Road is going to be um, cut off with a turnaround. It currently includes a mix of commercial and office uses, some of which appear to be vacant. The US 311 bypass study recommends that this area, as well as the remainder of Greensboro Road to Wren Farm Road, act as a traditional main street with local commercial uses to, subvert, to serve the surrounding neighborhood. Greensboro Road, as I mentioned before, will be less traveled and more likely to function as a main street that could serve the local area. It is currently designated on the land use plan as local convenience commercial with a small piece of community regional commercial on the western end and low density residential along Ring Street. An expansion of the local convenience commercial designation is recommended to cover this entire area. The current zoning in this area is general business and residential single family five. Area five, area five is located on the south side of the bypass between Enterprise Drive and just east of Ring Road in this area here. It is approximately 36 acres. There will be a traffic signal at uh, Enterprise Drive and the new T intersection. This is Enterprise Drive here and this is the new T intersection. There will also be an 80 foot access point. You can't really see it on this map, but right about here, there is going to be an 80 foot access point to the bypass to access this undeveloped land here to the south. The Ring Street intersection will not have a signal. It will be a right in, right out, and there'll be a median in the middle of the bypass. There are some large undeveloped parcels in this area but there is also a perennial stream that runs through it and that um, through the two southern parcels that will impact the, its ability to develop. It could be an opportunity for the development of a shopping center with a cohesive mix of commercial uses, possibly a hotel and higher density residential housing. It is currently split between community regional commercial and low density residential on the land use plan. It is recommended to change to mixed use development to support uses for the community and the traveling motorists along I-74. It is currently zoned residential single family five. If the area is developed, lot consolidation will be needed to maximize the development potential and protection of neighborhoods to the east and south will be important to maintain their stability. <clears throat> Moving on, area six, is shown over here on the south side of the bypass 
between North Scientific Street and the railroad tracks. It's approximately 30 acres. It's currently a mix of single family residential and an industrial use, which is a grading company. There is some potential for redevelopment for residential in this area due to the new signalized section, uh, intersection at the bypass and Scientific Street. And it is diagonally across from the new subdivision of Wren Farm. It is currently designated as light industrial on the land use plan. The zoning in this area is a mix of residential single family five, heavy industrial and light industrial. Land use designation is recommended to change from the light industrial to medium density, medium density residential to support a mix of higher density housing in this area. A change in zoning in this area should, however, be developer driven so the conditional zoning can be utilized to ensure that the land use policies are met and the adjacent neighborhoods are protected. Area seven, we're closing in just two more areas, is on the southwest corner of the bypass in Dillon Road, which will also have a signal. It's approximately 34, area, 34 acres. It is located outside the city limits. It is adjacent to the future Dillon Road Park, which is right in here, which is currently owned by the city. There is potential for redevelopment with a mix of housing styles and densities, such as twin homes, townhomes, or multifamily. Uh, water and sewer will, be, will need to be extended into this area, and therefore it will need to be annexed into the city to receive those services. The land use designation is recommended to change from low density residential to medium density residential. A change in zoning, as I've said before, should be developer driven to ensure that land use policies are met and adjacent neighborhoods are protected. It is currently zoned residential single family three within the city's extraterritorial zoning jurisdiction. Okay, the final area, area eight, it is on the southeast corner of the bypass and Dillon Road. It is approximately 96 acres located outside city limits. About a third of the area is within the Oakdale Reservoir General Watershed and two thirds of it are within the Oakdale Reservoir Critical Tier 3. Critical Tier 3 limits development to two dwelling units per acre at 35% built upon area. There's also a perennial stream in the area that runs north to south just east of Dillon Road that may impact the, the ability for this to be developed. Currently, the area is mostly undeveloped with some rural residential uses. The area may have potential for some increased uh, residential uh, development. Water and sewer will need to be extended into this area and therefore annexation into the city will be required. It is recommended to change from low density residential to medium density residential. Um, due to the watershed uh, restrictions and impacts for the stream, land assembly will be needed to achieve the higher densities. It is currently zoned in the county as agricultural and residential single family 40, which allows one dwelling unit per acre. A change in zoning um, should, be should be considered as developer driven, again, to ensure that land use policies are met and <laughs> properties are protected. The next steps are we need to complete uh, the public review drafts of these assessments. We are still fine tuning and making some, um, some uh, uh, final tweaks to them. We'll then move into the public input phase. We're going to create a project website. We're going to have to mail notice to all of those folks that are in these areas and let them know that we will be holding Zoom meetings. We're proposing two Zoom meetings, one for each one of the corridors so that we can focus just solely on each one of them at each meeting. Um, we're going to need to try to have some um, interaction during those meetings. And we'll also uh, do some um, uh, comment sheets that we'll post up on the web on the web page. Um, we are shooting for these uh, Zoom meetings probably towards the end of the year, possibly November or December, or November and December. 
Um, we'll do the Eastchester one first and then the bypass second. Then we'll have to go through the public hearing process early next year, which could be as early as January for the Planning and Zoning Commission and February for the City Council. I'd like to answer any questions that you have now. Again, this is just being presented to you for your information and we will come back at a later time for a public hearing after the public input that I have described. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions? Very well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And that brings us to the director's report. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple things to uh, mention to you uh, in briefing. Make my glasses. Um, I'm going to ask Herb to talk a little bit about, in just a few minutes, about the comprehensive zoning map amendment uh, process and give you a brief update on where we are with that and sort of where it's headed. Um, just a couple other things to note. Um, we are working on some watershed text amendments as well as a wireless telecommunication text amendment. Uh, we anticipate being able to brief you at your next meeting um, on those two amendments. Uh, they'll come to you at a later date, but I'd like to give you a sort of an update and a brief and a, probably a copy of those amendments at your next meeting. Um, your next meetings are um, for your October 27th and corresponding Thursday 29th. Uh, we have two zoning map amendments at this point in time scheduled for that. And then I also have listed there on the agenda there just your uh, dates for your uh, November and December meetings as well, which are moved up. Um, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to ask Herb to come up and give you a brief update on where we are with the comprehensive zoning process, where we've been, and sort of where this is headed and how long it may take to get there. Briefly, just an update on the comprehensive zoning, zoning map amendment project. We've been bringing these to you and giving you updates on them, but just want to give you a big picture overview. I'm not going to go through all the details because every time we do a report, I kind of give you a quick summary of the, the main purpose is to re remove um, zoning that's either not consistent with the land use policy or old obsolete zoning. And many of the ones that are coming forward are old conditional use zonings. Some are not, but most of them are the old conditional use zonings. Many of those were adopted in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, since 1980, there have been three updates to the development ordinance. The last being in 2017, which updated the ordinance that was initially adopted in 1993. And many of those conditions from those older ordinance have been um, those issues of compatibility have been incorporated into the new ordinance. For example, many of the um, zonings from the 1980s in environmentally sensitive areas had conditions about stream buffers. Well, that's now part of the ordinance. So you don't need conditions on those. And in the 1990s, when you go through a lot of those old zonings, there are conditions like standards for exterior lighting or, or parking lot landscaping. Well, that's now part of the ordinance. So those old conditions aren't really needed. This is an interactive map we have on our GIS mapping system. Before we even started this project, the planning and development department went through and kind of looked at the whole city and say, what are areas that we really need to look at? And I'm gonna kind of just start in the northern part of the city. I'm gonna zoom out a little. But we kind of went through and looked at the whole city. Those areas shaded in purple and in red are the areas that we want to look at. So you can see there's still quite a bit of area that throughout the city that we are going to be evaluating. That's why when I do my presentation, I'm letting you know this is multi-year. We're going to be kind of eat that elephant one bite at a time and go through with the ultimate goal, trying to make sure those old zonings don't hinder development. If we can remove old zoning conditions and just get general zoning, when a developer goes in those areas or area needs to redevelop, it prevents them from having to come through the rezoning process. Um, the first rounds were started in 
2018, and we're now in round three. So we've been moving along. There are two more areas um, that we're going to be looking at that we'll be bringing forward to you. One at your October meeting and the last, maybe by the end of the year, that would finalize round three. Staff is in a process of evaluating and putting together round four grouping for council to initiate. And then in 2021, we'll start bringing you in chunks those areas for round four. To date, we have rezoned 1,310 parcels, um, totaling about 778 acres. That's about 2% of the city. And once a, either a case is either approved or denied, we are updating this map. So these areas that are either shaded in purple or red, if it's approved, we're changing it to this teal color. I'm just going to zoom in. And this is kind of areas that we've looked at. So these areas that you see in the teal color, those have been reviewed and approved. As you recall, at our last meeting, we had an area where the neighbors had some concerns and the case was withdrawn. That was just one off of Bellmead. If there's a situation where either a request is denied or staff is of the opinion, those conditions are still valid. We want to keep those. Or this area may need additional evaluation. We're coloring it teal, but putting a hatch through so that either we can come back and look at it in the future, or when we do those, we put a note. Like for this one, we put a note saying, um, surrounding property owners want to keep the buffering conditions. So when we look at it in the future or other staff look at it in the future, they know why we kept that zoning there. Or we may have a note, this requires deeper input and evaluation and meetings with the property owner. So we're putting notes in so that once we finish everything, we're gonna come back and look at those cross hatch areas and say, does this area need future study or are there conditions we wanna keep so that future staff members know why that was done. But that's just a quick summary of how we mapped out the city, the areas that staff is looking to evaluate and how we're keeping track of those changes. Are there any questions at this time or Lee, Chris, anything additional you wish to add? Doesn't appear so. Okay. I would note um, I, I, each time I present, I tell you about the phone calls we received. We have not received a lot of comments. Before we even start the public hearing for an item, we send out an early notice. Just to, you know, you see zoning signs pop in your neighborhood, the phones start ringing, the public hearings packed, but the goal is let's send out this early notice. Let's get the input from those neighbors or at least let them know what's going on. Do you send those out before you post the zoning sign? We send out an early notice before we even set a public hearing date. Then based on those comments, we set a public hearing date and then we send out the notice and do legal ads and post signs for PNZ. Then we send out another notice for city council and repost the signs and do another legal ad. So by the time it gets to you or council, most of the questions have been addressed. And as always of any rezonings, we send out notices to all property owners within 300 feet. So what staff is finding that first early notice, we're catching the initial concerns from the property owners. By the time we send out the PNZ notice, those property owners within 300 feet are getting notified and we're addressing them. And by the time it goes to council, there are very few if little concerns because we've made an attempt to address their concerns early. Very good. Any questions from the commission? Thank you, Mr. Shannon. If uh, there is no other business this evening, I will move that we recess this meeting until Thursday evening, the 24th, 6 o'clock p.m. in this room. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner McGill has seconded the motion. I'll ask the recording secretary to take a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Response to the motion to recess the meeting to Thursday, the 4th of 6th. Mr. Yes. Mr. Kirkman. Yes. Mr. Kirkman. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Venable. Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have seven votes in favor of the motion. Very well. By a vote of seven to zero, we are recessed until Thursday evening, 24th at 6 p.m. in these chambers. Thank you.